Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, hi everyone. My name's Jane, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, I would say it's a pleasure being here, but I'm so bloody nervous, I'm not sure it's a pleasure at the moment. <laughs> Uh, no, I am genuinely pleased to be here, and uh, thanks, Janester, for asking me. Um, my sobriety date's the 26th of August, 2003, so last Friday I celebrated 19 years of continuous sobriety with the help of this fellowship and everybody in it, and I certainly couldn't have done it on my own, so I had a fair helping from my higher power as well. Um yeah, I mean, I, nice to see some people that I met at Leeds as well here, so it's nice to see you. And thanks to my friends that have come to to give me support. It means a lot. I'm, um, I'm the only, well, I'm not the only child. I felt like the only child in my family because I felt so different. But I've got two brothers and a sister that we couldn't have been more different. And... I'm the only alcoholic in this family. There's no alcoholism in the background, no history of it, none at all. And uh, my brothers and sisters, they like a drink, but they're not alcoholics. And we grew up in a household that wasn't bad, but it wasn't great. One thing about my family was that my mum and dad didn't love each other. And to that part, they didn't like each other. And so we were very much separated as a family. And my dad would sit up one end of the room, my mum would sit up the other end of the room. And we would act, well, mainly me, would act as a go-between. And as a result, you know, we didn't feel very close, because how could I? You know, I was just a messenger girl. But the one thing that, in my family that really did haunt me was the fact that we weren't allowed to show any emotion. We weren't allowed to be happy. Well, you know, we weren't allowed to be sad, weren't allowed to be angry. We just were not permitted to express any kind of excessive emotion. And the one time I did, I got told by my dad that I was to never, ever tell anyone ever again what happened outside, what happened inside the walls of the home ever again. And, you know, that was my one and only attempt until later on in my life where I would actually try and seek help. There was, I was um, abused as a child, not by my family member, but a friend of the family. And that just compounded things of how I felt about myself. And so, you know, when I was anywhere, I always tried to get myself adopted because I thought I was adopted for a start because I'm so different from the rest of the family. But I would always try and get myself adopted onto another family, anything that was better than mine, anywhere that, you know, if I was on holiday with the family and I saw another family that looked happy, that looked contented, that looked like they loved each other, I would try and gate crash the family, you know, and I literally would hijack them for the length of the holiday. They, they had to take me everywhere. And so I never saw much of my family, and that was fine by me. But of course, you know, like in most things, they didn't take me home with them. So it was back to reality. Unfortunately, my mum got severely ill when I was around 10 years old. And... That was when I had to start growing up real quick because I had to become my mother's carer. My mum wouldn't let anybody else look after her. And so at the age of 10, I was doing things that a child shouldn't do. I was seeing things that a child shouldn't see and having to be responsible for a child that shouldn't be responsible. You know, the, t- the tables had turned and I was became the parent. 
And I couldn't deal with that. I found that so difficult to deal with. But I had nowhere to go with the feelings and the emotions that it brought up. So I just buried them behind this wall of bricks, you know, and I was I just did not know where to go. And so it started to come out in my behaviour. And, you know, I was a straight A student who was suddenly starting to not be a straight A student. And, you know, I struggled and I was 14 when I first came across alcohol. And I was on a school trip and away in Switzerland and... I became increasingly emotional one night, couldn't handle the feelings I was feeling. And a teacher said to me, have one of these. One of these turned out to be a Cinzano and lemonade. So I don't know many places where you'd get a teacher telling, offering their children a drink, but that was my first introduction to alcohol. And my immediate thinking was, well, if one makes you feel better, then surely, you know, you're going to feel great by the time you keep drinking more and more and more. And the thing was, I loved it. I loved the taste and I loved what it did. And it made the world seem round again because the world felt like it was full of jagged edges to me, you know, and it took, the, it took that painful jaggedness away and I managed to cope with the world. And straight away the next night, I was uh, I was already thinking, well, what could be wrong with me tonight that can justify why I'm allowed to have another drink? Because I must have something wrong with me, because that's how you get a drink. You know, and that was where my introduction into the land of alcoholism, because emotionally and mentally I became addicted very, very quickly. I was immediately into that insanity of alcoholism and from that moment on whenever I could possibly get hold of alcohol I did you know and the alcoholism progressed in me real quick and within two years I was on a bottle of spirits a day now I'm not saying that for a big look at me I drank a bottle of vodka a day it's just to highlight how quickly alcoholism went was rapid in me. But I was about, about that time, I had my best friend at school. She was murdered. And because I didn't know how to handle it, I mimicked the feelings that you had because I didn't know what feelings you were meant to have. I didn't know how you were meant to express them. And so I mimicked the emotion and people saw it and I can still remember the comments that were made towards me about how I didn't you know that I really didn't care and that I was just making it up that I felt for anything for her which couldn't have been further from the truth but it was just because I didn't know you know I'd never been taught any of this but like I say you know I was drinking within a couple of years, a day at a time, you know, drinking a lot of booze. And like I say, I loved it. And so on the way to school, I'd go in my school uniform, go in with my checkbooks. I thought I was grown up with a checkbook. And I'd go in and I'd go and buy a bottle of drink and then I'd buy that amazing profit of, I would buy a packet of chewing gum because I thought that would hide the taste. You know, not that it could have been any more, like, obvious. I'm in a school uniform. I'm 16 years old, and I'm, I'm four foot nine at my height. So I look like a te- I look like a 10-year-old, you know, and I'm in there buying a bottle of booze and a packet of chewing gum. You know, who was I trying to kid? I was, you know, madness. And I would have two books... I would have two... Um, two lockers at school. One was for me books and one was for me booze. You know, and I thought I was really clever to have that because, you know, whenever if I got into trouble or somebody said, oh, we can smell booze up in the locker room, you know, they could come searching and they wouldn't find anything. 
until one one afternoon I went and dropped a bottle of booze over the, on the floor and it stank. I mean, I cried because, not because I was going to get caught out, but because I dropped a bottle of booze. You know, it was like, oh, shit, what am I going to get me drink from today? And that was when the teachers at my school first became aware that I was drinking because I was the only one there. It was obvious it was me. But like, you know, most alcoholics, we can lie very well. And I managed to get out of it without too much trouble. And, it, you know, it was amazing how easy the lies came out. You know, I'd never been one that lied. You know, I always told the truth. But when alcohol was concerned, you know, all my morals went out the window. You know, I was... You know, I'd been brought up the right way in the sense that I knew right from wrong. But when it was concerned with booze, there were no morals. There were no... There was no... I can't think of the word. There was no, you know... There was the, the the gates were off, you know what I mean? I could do what I wanted, when I wanted and how I wanted, and I would justify anything. And bear with me because I am really nervous, but, you know, within a year, I'd managed to get into so much trouble at school that I got expelled, all because of the drink. And, you know, I got caught numerous times I was failing all my classes and I got thrown out of school, which had never happened in my family. So I blackened the family name because I'd brought shame onto the family. You know, and even though my parents were told why I was, why I'd been expelled, you know, they didn't mention it at all. And this will show how crazy it was in my household. When I got expelled, I got... My, my parents got told first, but they never told me. They never told me I got expelled. So I went back to school, and I walk into the school, into the school hall, and I get hauled out quite quickly up to the headmaster's office. And they wouldn't believe me that I'd never been told I was expelled. You know, and that just shows how nothing was spoken about in my family. That you know, that sticking your head in the sand because we don't want to face anything that's not easy to solve. And I wasn't easy to solve. But, you know, I said, like, the morals and the values and everything that I thought I'd got grown up with went out the window, and they did. You know, and I became... I would, I would class it as I became a slut. You know, if you could give me a drink or you could give me money for a drink, then I would do what you wanted me to do. And I didn't have to know you to do it. You know, and so from an early age, my morals went out the window. And I remember hearing in a meeting when I first came back to the fellowship, somebody say, when you break that first taboo, it becomes easier and easier to break the next one, the next one, and the next one. And I really understood that now. I really understand that because, you know, I was a bit of a prude, really, even though with the things that had happened as a child, you know. But my, when I became, when it got alcohol in my system, I just became anybody's. Didn't matter how young or old you were, I was yours. And... You know, that just perpetuated the cycle of how I was starting to feel about myself. You know, I knew I wouldn't, well, I wasn't seeing that alcohol wasn't working. It was already having its consequences. It was already causing me pain. But I chose not to acknowledge it. And I still carried on thinking that I've got the answer. And I started my drinking in toilets. You know, a lot of people end up drinking in toilets. I saw how I started off. I would sit in public toilets in South London with a bottle and just think that I had the answer to the life's problems and that anybody else out there who was getting an education or working, I just thought they were mental. I just thought, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you want to be with me sitting here in a dirty, scummy toilet in South London 
you know, and I think I knew it all. You know, that amazing only an alcoholic can look down from the gutter, you know, and God, I was a big headed little so and so. And, um, you know, I escaped from home, and that's how I view it. I escaped from home and I went to live in Croydon in South London. And, you know, I started, I started losing things. I started losing my mind. And this was when I had my first introduction to a mental institution. And it, by, it was by no means my last. And it was there I'd gone out in the car drunk, smashed up my car, and ended up being arrested. And as a result, I had a breakdown and went into a mental institution. But even while I was in there, I was getting people to smuggle booze into me. You know, I was still escaping out of the ward to go and get the drink. And one night I escaped from the ward. It was locked ward and I escaped from it out to get a drink. And as a direct result of me being out getting a drink, I was raped by a stranger. And I was ceremoniously dumped back at the hospital where I was staying. And, you know, as a result of that, I got thrown out of the hospital because I'd broken the rules. There was no concern as to what had happened. I just got told it was your fault. You deserved what you had happened to you. And I just went in on myself even more. And I, you know, I drank more and more to try and hide away how I was feeling, trying to hide away that, hide away from that disgust, you know, and shame and guilt that I'd been feeling for a number of years. You know, I couldn't see that, you know, all these things that I was feeling bad about, alcohol was involved every single time. You know, Nothing, it was either my drinking or somebody else's drinking that caused it, you know, but booze was involved and I just couldn't and wouldn't see it. And so my solution was to carry on drinking. I thought that was the only way I had of coping. And, you know, as a result of drinking, I met my ex-husband and, um, yeah, my ex-wanker of a husband, I should say, um, Excuse my French. I met my ex-husband and uh, he was a drinker and we just fueled each other's drinking. But he was also a nasty piece of work and it became a very violent marriage. And, you know, there was lots of physical abuse, sexual abuse and mental abuse. You know, and I, all I would do was hide more into the drink to just remove myself from reality because reality was just too painful. You know, but I have, should have mentioned but at this point that I'd had two children. And, uh, you know, I was by no means a good mum. I did my best, but my best wasn't good enough because I couldn't show them love because I'd never been shown that. I couldn't show them how to express themselves because I'd never been shown that but worst of all they came second to my alcohol they never once were above it you know and I would do anything to get a drink and when I was in a pub one night with my youngest son my eldest son sorry desperate for money I raffled him off and I meant it you know, and I managed to get the money off this guy and I told him to take my son. You know, this guy was just disgusted with me. He was just doing it to shut me up, just gave me, I don't know how much money it was. But I meant it, you know, and the worst thing was that my son knew I meant it. You know, that's how low I would go. I would sell my own son for a drink. You know, and, you know, that's one of the things when I think back now that I can never forgive myself for. I live with it. But, I, you know, it's one that you just go, there's no amount of forgiveness for that. But, you know, I was sick. 
But at the end of the day, I have to accept responsibility for my actions. Um, as I say, me and my husband, you know, we just carried on beating the crap out of each other, basically. And I drank. That summed up 10 years of marriage. Booze, fists, and, and that was it. Booze and fists. And when they finally, when my me and my ex-husband finally split up, it was the best day of my life. But the thing was, my husband took my kids with him on holiday to America and never came back as a result of my drinking. And as a result of that, I've not seen my children for over 20 years now. I don't know where they are. I don't know what they're doing. All I've managed to find out is that apparently I'm a grandma. But that's it. But I'm a grandma in name only. I'm a mother in name only. You know, and I have to live with that. But that's as we, you know, if I put as much effort into caring about those kids as I do now, back then, they would never have gone. But the thing was, booze was more important. And when they went, I just thought, what a great excuse to get pissed again. And what a great excuse to have in the pub. You know, a real war story to tell them in there. Everyone's going to feel sorry for Jane then. But nobody felt more sorry for Jane than Jane. You know, we talk about a zap, a vat of self-pity. I lived in a swimming pool of self-pity. You know, Jesus, I was... I felt so sorry for myself. Nobody could live up to the amount of self-pity that I would show to myself because I thought, woe is me, you know. All these terrible things have happened to me. What have I done that's wrong? You know, where's my part in it? I wouldn't see that there was alcohol was my part in it, that I had a huge part in my life. And not all the things that happened were my fault, but I still had a part of foot in them. But I didn't know that at the time, you know, I was just blundling along, getting drunk and just, you know, waking up each morning and crying into that first drink that I had because I knew that was as good as it was going to get. I knew that after that first drink, I never knew what was going to happen for the rest of the day. I didn't know if I'd make it to the end of the day. I didn't know if I'd make it to the next morning. And frankly, I didn't care. You know, I hated waking up, well, coming to in the morning because that meant I was alive. And I didn't want it. I didn't want it anymore. You know, nothing was working to take away that pain in my head. Nothing was working and the consequences were fast rolling in. You know, I ended up homeless because of my husband going away. You know, so I ended up on the streets of London and I'm only lucky because I am the gift of the gab that I managed to sofa surf. So I didn't actually have to literally have to sleep on the streets of London. But I had one bag and that was it to my name. And I just travelled around the south of England, sleeping on people's sofas and floors, just anywhere that I could get a bed. I ended up in Wiltshire, you know, with people I didn't even know, and I got a bed there. You know, I just, I was just lost. I was lost in the world of alcoholism and lot, didn't see and couldn't see a way out. Now, don't get me wrong, people had been offering me support over the years. You know, but I'd never taken that support because I was told, remember, that I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody about what was going on. So I could never accept that help, because I thought I wasn't allowed to. And plus the fact they always said that I had to stop drinking, which, to me, that was not an option. You know, I might have accepted help, but I had to carry on drinking. That was my stipulation. And surprise, surprise, nobody took that on. But I first came across, you know, AA when I was in one of my numerous stays in the hospital. And while I was in the, the um, unit, we had to go to two AA meetings a week. And uh, 
I wouldn't admit that I was an alcoholic. I was just being a sarky little cow by saying that I just had a rough six months, that I wasn't an alcoholic. It was just rough times. And that if only life would sort me out better, I'd be all right. And we went to a meeting one day, and this woman, I always remember it, she stood up in motorbike levers, and she said, I've been an alcoholic from the day I was born. And I remember shouting out, what a load of bollocks. You must, what, were you sucking on a bottle of gin instead of your mother's tip? You know, subtle that I was, you know, and just went, oh, for God's sake. And there I am sitting at the back of the room with half a cup of coffee because I'm not trusted with a full cup, right, rattling away. And I think I've got the answer. You know, that arrogance of an alcoholic of thinking that I knew best. Needless to say, people just looked at me, shook their heads and just ignored me, which was probably the best thing to do. But that was what that I took as being, you don't want me. I know I'm right and I don't want what you have. I didn't want what I had. You said about God and, you know, good orderly direction and group of drunks. I just said, go on drinking. That's what God stands for, and left. And I carried on drinking. I thought, yeah, God wants me to do that. And so I never came back to AA for a very long time and just went back out drinking. I mean, I'd been in this unit for six weeks and been dry. And on my first night out, I ended up licking tequila off of a bar in Soho. That's how much I'd taken notice of the detox and the help that was offered. You know, I just did not know how to stop. But more to the point was I didn't want to stop. That was the point. That was the important thing. I had no problem admitting that I was an alcoholic, but accepting it was something different. I would tell anybody that listened that I was an alky. I thought it was a job description. You know, that's why I'm in a pub all the day. That's why I'm drunk all the time. You know, trying to be a cocky little so-and-so. And, you know, my body had started to pack up separate from the booze. My body was starting to pack up with a congenital condition that I have. And, you know, this meant that I could drink in the pubs now because I got disability money. I thought I was, like, mega rich. And I started drinking in the pubs. And, you know, that's where I lived for about another seven years. And I was in and out of the nut house again. I was in and out of trouble. I was, you know, just in and out of everything. Nobody would get near to me. I wouldn't let anybody close to me. The only use you had for me was, can you buy me a drink? Can you give me, I thought, comfort, which meant sex? You know, I heard a saying once that to have sex, a woman needs to feel loved and a bloke needs to feel loved and a bloke needs to have sex to feel loved. And I was very much like the bloke, you know, I mistook love and lust, you know, and I thought they were the same thing. And so, you know, I was never, like I say, I carried on being a slut from the age of 14. And I came across, there came a time in my life where I finally got that gift of desperation. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't in the fellowship and I didn't come to the fellowship, but I did go to an, uh, an alcohol unit called in York where I'd been shipped up to hospital. And I'd been put in this hospital in York to get me out of some trouble in, in London, so... You know, I'd gone up there, and that was when I first got introduced to this York Alcohol Service. And the amazing thing about that was they did get me off the drink. But what they didn't show me was recovery. I was two and a half years off the drink and white-knuckling it the whole time. And I can tell you that was the most frightening time of my recovery and of my drinking years was that first two and a half years off the drink because I had no program. I had no fellowship around me. I had no rules to life. You know, I had no guidelines to how to live life on life's terms. 
what I had was I knew how to stay off the drink, but I didn't know how to live recovery. You know, for me, you know, having no alcohol in my blood is always amazing. Sobriety is always amazing. But recovery is the thing that's tough, that goes up and down. You know, and that's where life is, becomes difficult. And I was struggling and I was at the jumping off point after two and a half years. I was in hospital again on five minute suicide watch. And there was somebody that I'd met in a hospital who had come to AA. And she had more peace and serenity in her little fingernail for eight months than I'd had in two and a half years off the drink. And she said, why don't you come to a meeting? What have you got to lose? And for the first time, I genuinely saw what she said and heard what she said and realised that I had nothing to lose. You know, what I was on five-minute suicide watch. I was going to die. So I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. And so I went to a meeting for the first time with my ears wide open. Instead of going in with them wide shut, and thinking that I hadn't, you know, had it all sorted and thinking I had this arrogance of, look at me. And something happened in that meeting that I never know what it was. I don't know what was said. But something happened that got me to a second meeting 24 hours later. And so for me, I always think that as important as the first meeting is, that second meeting is so vital. Because I had loads of first meetings I just didn't have any second meetings. They came like five years later, seven years later. But that second one within 24 hours was the one that got, got me. It was the one that said, Jane, maybe you're finally letting go. Maybe you're finally surrendering. Just maybe you haven't got the right idea. Just maybe you don't know how to live life on life's terms. And just maybe... AA is something that you want. And that was like, oh, that was shocking to me. I couldn't believe it. I just did not know. You know, but I still came in with that ego of somebody of two and a half years off the drink. I still thought, well, like, look at me. I've got no, I've been sober two and a half years. And yet when I went into that meeting that night, they thought I was two and a half, two and a half days off the drink because I looked so bad. You know, I was kidding nobody. And that's one of the greatest benefits of AA. You can't kid a kidder. You know, and I've been bullshitting my entire life to anybody and everybody around me and managed to get away with everything. But I wasn't getting away with it in these rooms. Thank God. You know, people could see through me. They could see through my arrogance, my ignorance. You know, they could see through my ego. You know, and I started to realise that it just maybe, you know, maybe I needed to accept that I was an alcoholic. You know, doing step one again, you know, admitting my alcoholism was no problem. But somewhere deep inside of me, I knew that if I had if accepted my that I was an alcoholic, I would have to do something about it. And that required hard work. And I'm a lazy little shit. I don't want to do hard work. I just want everybody else to do it for me. You know, you've got it all. You've got the answers, you guys. So come on, you just tell me what to do and I'll do it and I'll pass and you'll give me a great day at the end and everyone, jobs are good. And then you say, no, you've got to do the work. I'm like, oh, shit, I've got to do it. And that was like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. To do an honest, almost like do an honest day's work. I'd never done an honest day's work in my life. But, you know, I had to start letting go. I had to start realising that AA had a way of living that was, that was far better than what I knew. That there were people in these rooms that I'd heard their stories and some that had worse stories than me, some that didn't. But they'd all been at that same point, that same dropping off point, that same rock bottom. 
firmly believe we all have the same rock bottom. The material things around it might change, but whether you're in a mansion or a cardboard box, when you're at rock bottom, you're at that lowest point. You can't go any further emotionally and mentally. You know, it's not about the physical things around you. You know, I'd been to the streets, I'd been, I'd lost everything, and yet when I put down the drink, I had a flat that was being paid for. I didn't have to pay for a rent. You know, I had more than I'd had for years. But what had finally happened was that my head and my heart were finally starting to join up. They'd started to join up and realised that I wanted more out of life, that I wanted a life, and I wanted one that was better than what I had. I wanted one that wasn't filled with going in and out of mental institutions. I wanted one that didn't meant that I didn't sell my body to the nearest bidder. So I wanted one that where I could be proud of, you know, where people could be proud to call me a friend and where I could give something back. You know, it wasn't all about me. I mean, obviously, I wanted stuff for myself, but I began to realise that I had to give something back if I wanted to keep what I'd got. You know, this is not a one-way programme. It's a two-way programme. Just like the doors of AA swing both ways, thank God. You know, because if the doors of AA hadn't swung both ways, I'd never have got back in these rooms. You'd have gone, excuse me, love, Shift your up, get out, don't darken our doorstep again. But you didn't. You said, come back in. Just see it. Let's see if it works this time. Trust in a higher power, trust in the program, trust in us. You know, and it was it was enticing. And I thought, I want what you've got. I really want what you've got. And that was a revelation to me to finally, just finally surrender to my disease of alcoholism and surrender to a higher power that I did not know what to do, that I was powerless over alcohol. My life was definitely unmanageable, despite the fact, you know, no matter what I try and tell myself, my life was unmanageable. You know, and I couldn't ignore the fact that I was powerless over alcohol. That had been through for the last 20 years. But I did have a struggle with the higher power. You know, I'd never had any kind of upbringing with a spirituality or religion, and I couldn't separate spirituality and religion. And when I did step three, my sponsor said, if you're struggling with the term higher power, why don't you think of it as handing your will and your life over to the care of a 12-step program of recovery? Now, that I could understand. That I could grab onto because I knew the 12-step program was the way to go. That I could lay my hands on. It was tangible. And so that's what I did when I first did step three. And it helped me progress on in the program that, you know, it. we don't necessarily grab a higher power the minute we walk in the doors of AA. It's For me, it was a learnt thing. You know, and it's changed over the years. But I still have that premise that I know that a power greater than me has helped me stay sober. And that power is the 12-step program of recovery. You kept me sober for the last 20 years, 19 years, sorry. But just getting sober doesn't mean to say that life becomes a bowl of a bunch of roses and, you know, straight away. Because life still happens, recovery still happens. My body was still packing up, and I'd have to go into hospital and have 17 operations trying to fix my shoulders and my arms. And as a result, I lost the use of the majority use of my arms. You know, and, you know, I felt so sorry for myself then. I thought, look, look at me, I'm four foot nine and can't even use my arms properly. And I'm a drunk. And I felt sorry for myself again. But I knew that somewhere in this program that I had to realise it was an inside job as well. That if anybody was going to start loving me, I had to start loving me. I had to start having a feeling inside that 
washed out that feeling of self-pity that didn't... How can I put it? I know we call it brainwashing, but I needed a whole body wash. You know what I mean? I needed a whole lot of scrubbing. And um, sorry, I just had some weird lights go past my window. I think it was some coppers. It was not me. So the coppers are coming out to get me, I think. Uh, right, sorry about that. You know, but if anybody was going to love me, I had to start loving myself. And that meant, like I say, working an honest program, doing an honest day's work. I knew this program would work for me if I put my action in, but it wasn't going to happen just by me sitting at a meeting, sitting on a seat, not re- not talking to people, not sharing honestly with people, not opening up. It wasn't going to happen. You know, I knew I had to open up and give something back to this fellowship, not just something. I had to give all of me. Because I firmly believe that, you know, if I want it all for me as well, I've got to give all of me back. You know, not just one part, not just my head, not just my heart, not just my goal, but everything, everything that I value. And like I say, you know, life didn't get perfect straight away and it's not perfect now. But what did become easier was that being sober became easier. I started to love being sober. You know, I had these friends. I started to build up a friendship with people, you know. For the first time in my life, I had true friendships. I wasn't after anything from you. And you weren't after anything from me. You know, it still didn't mean that, say, like, you know, I suffered with depression for years. I was still having mega depressive episodes. But I didn't drink on it anymore because I knew the answer was in this program. It wasn't going to promise to take away things like that. But it did say that you would help me deal with anything without picking up a drink. It promised me that. And I was, you know, that was so enticing. Because I never knew when I went into deep, dark, depressive mode. I never knew if I'd come out again. But I did trust in this program and this fledgling higher power that said, if you just hang on, Jane, you'll get through it. You will come out the other side. Just don't pick up that drink. Don't pick up that first drink because it's that first drink that will kill you. You know, not only will it get you drunk, it will kill you, in my view. It may be a long, slow death, but, you know, one day at a time. You know, without this program, I know I'd be dead by now. I know that my lifestyle would have got me or the people I was involved with would have got me. You know, but I managed to get through these depressive episodes. And do you know what? Over the years, those depressive episodes have got further and further apart. And it's just been about me trusting this program. That's all it asks. Just trusting a program and working on this day. And you will get, you will be all right. But saying, you know, but that's not meant that, like I say, there haven't been times where life has become really bad. When I was nine years sober, I thought I had it all. You know, I thought I'm nine years sober. Look at me. And I was in a relationship that ended badly. But I didn't open up about it when it did finish. I kept all those feelings inside. And I went to open up my home group at the time and I was in a really bad frame of mind and I'd gone in that room not thinking I was going to drink. But I went into the kitchen at this church hall and there was a goblet of red wine and I just pushed the fuck it button. I went, I'm going to have that because I hadn't been honest with anybody about how I felt. And so I'd made my will had said I'm drinking. So I picked up that goblet and I got it between within an inch of my mouth. And suddenly this voice in my head, which was mine, just went, don't do it. Don't do it to all those people that have kept you safe over the years. Don't do it to all those people that have helped you through. 
just don't do it. And for the first time in my life, something greater than my will would stop me from drinking. And that was my introduction to a power greater than me. Because it was the first time, whenever I'd made that decision to drink before, nothing could stop me. But something about that voice just stopped me. It stopped me dead in my tracks. And I threw the sink drink away. And I went into the meeting and I shared about it. I was honest about it. You know, and that day has become, you know, a really important type day in my recovery because my my high power changed. It grew and it became something more solid. And life has been, you know, it's been an interesting life, shall we say. Like I say, full of ups and downs. But the one constant in my life over the last 19 years has been this fellowship. The one thing that hasn't gone away. Even when I've gone, oh, I don't need AA. I can't stand AA. I can't stand all the women. They all look nicer than me. They all dress nicer than me. They're all posher than me. You know, they're all slimmer than me, and the blokes aren't much better either. He looks nicer to dress, but she's rubbish, you know. And so, you know, even when I was trying to push AA away, AA wouldn't let me. He just said no. And I would get so bloody angry. Like, will you just F off? You know what I mean? I don't want any of you. But you just stayed there and you just went, you're not going anywhere, Jane. Just don't do it. And so I had to hang in there until that moment, that gift of desperation came again where I was willing to give something back, willing to engage in this program again and be willing to work with my sponsor, be willing to work with everybody in this fellowship, do service, you know, get back to giving it away. You know, whenever, when I felt the best that I could feel in my recovery, it's been when I've been doing service, it's been when I've been opening up, it's been when I've been giving something back. But when I've gone take, 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 that's when I've been selfish, that's when I've gone, do you know what, I don't want to be here anymore, I don't need AA. I don't need any of you. And I've started to move away from the program. And much to my cost, because four years ago, I moved so far away from the program that I tried to commit suicide. And although that was the worst, one of the worst days of my life, I look back now and I actually genuinely, hand on heart, now can say that that was one of the most amazing moments of my life. By some miracle, I survived. Nobody knows how, but I did. But I hadn't had a drink. I hadn't wanted to drink. I knew that wouldn't work, but I'd wanted to die because I'd left this program. I'd left my recovery and I'd left, left everything that I held dear. And I'd given in to that black dog in the head. I'd let that win. But you know what? Everybody in the program that I knew that just stood around me and they helped with the help of the mental health services, helped drag me back from the edge. And I can safely say that these last four years have been the best four years of my life. You know, I worked, started working with a sponsor again because I had been sponsoring myself for 10 years, which proves that it's not a very good idea. Trust me, it's not a good idea. I did try and I started to learn to believe my own lies and look what happened. You know, it's not worth gambling your life with. You know, and I've got a sponsor who I trust implicitly that, you know, I've known a long time and it's been great starting to work with her and just getting a different, a different colour of my recovery. You know, I love my recovery now. I love what AA's given me. I love the life it's given me. I mean, physically, I'm in the worst shape I've ever been. But you know what? It doesn't matter. That's not going to go away, that side of me. That's something I have to live with and I have to learn to accept, and I do. 
but the rest of my life, how I feel emotionally, how I feel in my head and my heart, I've never felt stronger. I've never felt like that I've loved this fellowship more than I have done these last four years. And it's just put a whole new cement on my recovery, you know, that means that I know that I'll be all right. I know that everything's going to be okay. Now, I'm sorry there's not been loads of quotes from the big book and all of that jazz. I'm not one for quotes. I get them all mixed up, you know what I mean, and end up having part of one quote linked with another one and it makes complete sense to nobody but me. So I'm apologising if you're not, you're all going to get loads of, like, amazing quotes in the big book. I'm sorry about that. But what I've shared is the truth. What I have shared is my honest truth. And what I've shared is what has come out of my heart tonight. I hope that it's helped somebody. I hope not everybody's fallen asleep. You know, I know that this programme works if you're willing to put the work in. And it's not a lot to ask. Don't pick up that first drink, engage in the programme and engage with everybody else. That's not a lot. It was a lot harder to work picking up a drink and, you know, working out how you're going to get that next drink or the next fibre, you know. So I want to thank everybody for keeping me sober. I really cannot do it without you. And, you know, please, thank you. So thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.